Hey, what's going on, Clever Investors? Sperber here. Welcome back to my YouTube channel today. We got an amazing special guest, the great Jerome Maldonado, one of the best real estate investors that I personally know, somebody I look up to, and uh, is one of my personal mentors in the multifamily space. Now, he's much more than just a multifamily investor. He's gonna teach us today on how to build passive wealth and get to retirement where we're able to retire wealthy, have passive income coming in and live the rest of our life just free, man, just free. Um, he's been a builder, a real estate investor, a wholesaler. He's like done every type of deal under the sun. But in 2016? 2016. 2016, he made a major shift and started leaning in on multifamily. I love multifamily. I have a couple multifamily mentors. Vina Jetty's one of them. Bobby Castro's one of them. And Jerome is one, one of them. I've invested with Vina. I've studied a bunch of the greats. I love your business model the best because it gets you to retirement. It gets you massive, passive cash flow. And today I just want to have like a high level overview where Jerome, like the maestro he is, is just going to get on the whiteboard, do his thing and just school us. All right, so if you're interested in building massive amounts of passive income so you can retire wealthy, this video is gonna be for you. All right, Jerome, let's dive on in. All right, so I wanna, I'm just gonna sit right here and be a student of the game. Take us high level. Show us how somebody like me, because I'm, I'm Single family, I dominate. Multifamily, I'm a newbie again. I'm a, I'm a baby. I need to know the language. I need to know the strategy. I need to know, tell me what to do. My goal is to partner with you on our first deal. Yep. You can't just jump into multifamily, by the way. Not big multifamily. Like, we're going to try and do like 100 to 200 unit deal. Yep. I can't just go do that on my own. I actually have to have a sponsor. Yep. I have to have a mentor. I have to have somebody to show me what to do. So. Break it down, tell me what to do. You guys can be a fly on the wall and then maybe, who knows, we might all be doing a deal together someday, all right? So Cody, so one of the big things, the difference between I think a lot of what Bobby Castro is doing, what, what I'm doing, what Grant Cardone's doing, um, and some of the differences is that we're doing a lot of ground up construction and development for multifamily. Um, a lot of what they're doing is a lot of value add. Value add being um, they take an old asset, they remodel it, and then they, they build, build value and get big returns on it based on the value that they build. So we've done that. That's what we started in 2016. So I started off with my baby steps by buying uh, an 82 unit and a 76 unit in 2016. And so I learned, I've been in construction since the late 90s, as you know, and we, uh, in, so I knew the ground up construction. We did retail, we were doing um, office, warehouse, all of that stuff. But with the multifamily, I'd never done it, not from ground up. So I, I, I went in and I purchased an asset to understand how it works. I didn't know anything about the net operating income, didn't know anything about gross operating income, didn't know any of that stuff. Um, and so I learned all of it as I purchased the property. Okay, so for newbies out there that are watching this stuff, that don't have all the terminology down, I'm gonna talk higher level today. I'm not gonna go over all the definitions, I'm not gonna explain all that to you guys, but all of that information is right, uh, available on your cell phones right on Google, okay? So I'm gonna go through it and I'm gonna break it down. Now, one of the things that I love most about the ground up construction game is the profitability in doing so. Now, just like Cody said, you can't go in and just um, build a brand new apartment complex without the experience. The banks won't lend you money. So there's a few key components, right? So you got to understand, you got to understand the asset management side of it. You got to understand the project management side of it. You got to understand the acquisition side of it, which is the purchase of the land and then everything to finish construction and then the stabilizing part of it, which is where you make your revenue. Okay. That's what makes the, the asset um, worth. So real quick question and use black just so you have it. Just real quick question from start to finish about how long is the project going to take after you model it all out yep. to start, like let's say we find a deal and all the, to the time where it's stabilized and just printing cash for us. Is this one year, two years, three years? Like what's about the timeline? So it's, all, it's all different depending on the size obviously, but let's say a hundred unit deal, okay? Typically about two years. You're gonna spend about nine months in just um, in, in just dealing with all of your soft costs and all of your entitlements. Your entitlements being your prints, your architecture, your engineering, dealing with your survey companies, the dirt work, everything that goes into the project prior to actually turning dirt. If you may have some zone changes to do, some different stuff with the city, the municipalities, um, as far as the use 
of the land. And so all of that typically takes about nine months if you do, if you do everything right. It can take a little longer, so if it's your first deal, it might take a full year to go through it. And then physical construction on a 100 unit deal will take anywhere between 12 months and 16 months turnkey. Okay? okay. And we're pre-leasing before we actually finish the project. So like for example, um, one of my projects here is in the Phoenix metro area, it's in the, in the municipality of, of Youngtown. Um, we're, we're stabilizing 44 of 104 units and then we're going vertical at the same exact time with 60 new units. The 44 units, we'll have them finished now in October. Okay, so if you're watching this video, it's in uh, September 2022. Um, we have 30 days, we'll finish stabilizing 44 units. Now we're not done yet, but we're already pre-leasing them. So today's meeting down there was about landscaping because I can't pre-lease units where they look horrible. You know, so we're going in, we're, we're gutting old dead trees. This was an old office building that we actually um, decollateralized, which means we tore down part of it. We turned 44 units of the old office building into 44 units of multifamily, and then we're going vertical with new construction, 60 units. So as we're building the 60 units, we're already, we already have equity in the property. So there's a couple things that we're able to do, which is super cool in this scenario. Um, we're able to, we're, we start pre-leasing it before it's done. We have the income. We're able to take cost segregation studies. We're able to depreciate that portion of the asset this year to take advantage of the tax incentives. That's been our driving force to get that one done. And so we're able to depreciate whatever the value comes in at for those 44 units, which will be someplace right around $10 million. I'll get about a $10 million tax break. And then we'll go in and we'll do um, the other 60 units, which we'll finish by the tail end of spring, early summer of 2023. And then we'll take the tax segregation on that stuff next year and we'll depreciate all of that next year. And those tax, those tax breaks don't expire. So they'll, they'll last, live with us forever, okay? Which is super cool. But we'll stabilize, we'll start stabilizing 60 days before we even finish construction. Meaning that we'll go to the property management company and we'll allow them to come in, take footage. They get conceptual drawings on our four dimensional and three dimensional drawings. We'll usually use a company like Fiverr. We'll take our, our basic flat prints that are one dimensional. We'll take them, send them for about $200 to a company like Fiverr and they'll make them four dimensional. And we'll get videos and, and we'll get uh, three dimensional drawings and four dimensional videos made of our properties. And then we'll go to market with them months before we even finish the asset. And we'll already be leased before we even have the property stabilized. That's great. All right, so that's taking, a, that's taking an existing office building, converting it to an apartment building, then building a bunch of new construction for a total of 100 new units. 104 units. Okay, so let's step back, because that I, 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 I wanna make sure, I, I wanted to understand like, okay, this is like a two year, maybe a two and a half, three year play. From the time you make the decision, I wanna be in multifamily, and I wanna partner with a guy like Jerome, and I'm gonna listen to this video, I'm gonna go do exactly what it says, I'm gonna call Jerome one day, say I got a deal, whatever I have to bring to the table to partner with you. And then about three years from now, I'm gonna look at you and we're gonna be like, dude, we have 100 units that are leased, we're killing it, we're making money, let's go do another one. So bro, here's what's cool about it. It's like people think- I high five myself, by the way, I'm like- Dude, dude it's, it's just like, it's just like my, I'm just by myself high five. All right, so walk us through the whole so, thing. So here's what happens. We, we start with deal flow. So everything, as you know, starts with deal flow. We don't know sometimes what we're gonna acquire. We just want deal flow. We want projects that we think are gonna be viable coming our way. So we start planting seeds. And I've always explained it like planting a garden. You know, it's the same thing that people do in the wholesale business. They just start planting seeds with, seller, with potential sellers. And we do the same thing in the multifamily space. So we're looking for land and we're also looking for assets. So we look at distressed hotels, we look at distressed office building, we look at anything under the sun that's commercially zoned in some way, shape or form, even if it doesn't have the right use for multifamily at that given time. And so I think- You can change the, the, the usage, the zoning. Most of the time. Okay. Now, and one of the big things, there, there's a whole strategy behind that. It's a whole video in itself on how we do that. But just know that all zoning, especially in areas, one of the big things that we focus on right now is affordable housing because one of the biggest uh, asset classes that we're in need of right now is affordable housing because there's just, there's not enough yeah. of it out there. I mean, we have- All right, so, so we're looking for land. We're looking for old office building. We're looking at all the, so are we going to commercial brokers to find this? Are we going on LoopNet and scrolling around? Or is this something where like, that's not worth our time. Just put fillers out to a bunch of brokers and then they'll bring us deal flow. So here's what we typically do. When I go into a new city, I go in and I, I hit all the commercial multifamily brokers, okay? Not land guys, nothing. And I will say this with, with single family, multifamily, all of it's the same. The biggest, the biggest mistake most people make is they go after trying to find the land first, right? Wrong thing to do. 
You go in and you find the asset first, and then you once you find the assets where it, it, it hits your business model, then you look for the land around that area. And so what I do is I go into the multifamily uh, brokers. Now, multifamily brokers are just like, um, like physicians. They specialize in the field of, of uh, real estate that they specialize in. So if they're commercial retail, that's all they do. If they're office guys, that's all they do. Multifamily in big cities, they, you have the class A, which is the new construction multifamily guys. Then you got the class C guys that that's all they focus on is the older stuff. Okay. So I go in, I hit the class A and class um, C multifamily brokers. And I, I sit down with them, I'll, I'll fly in, and before I get there, I have my, my office, or you can do this, I did this myself when I didn't have an office and I didn't have somebody that, that did this stuff for me. I would just call and say, hey, my name is Jerome Maldonado, I'm a developer in the area. Now, you may never have developed anything in your life before, but if you're gonna develop it, guess what you are, you're a developer. So I just call them up and I say, hey, I'm a developer, we're doing a ton of projects wherever you live or wherever you're at, and I'll go, I'm in the Phoenix area, I'm developing a ton of real estate out here, and we're getting ready to migrate into Dallas, Texas, for example and we, we want to get into the multifamily space and I, I'm gonna be coming into town I have two short days so I need to meet you on this day or this day I just want to figure out what's the best time to meet you and then when we go in there I usually have a little spill of what I'm looking for I say look a lot of what we do is build and hold that means you build it we hold it we retain it we keep it and I, I'm looking for long-term passive income in the multifamily space and so I tell them I don't want anything under 100 units because as you guys will soon find out, I always have people come in and say, I want to play it safe. I want to start off with like 15 units, five units, eight units, whatever it is. And I tell them it takes just as much work to entitle and build five units as it does to build 105 units. There's no difference. Once you, once you go in, you understand the game, the same exact the same exact entitlements as far as architecture, engineering, surveying, everything is exactly the same, whether it's five units or 105 units, doesn't matter. So once you understand the game, you just go, why would I stay here when I can do this? Another thing that's cool is that once you get into over 100 units, it, institutions start liking that asset class. Under 100 units, institutions don't want to look at it. So everything that we're doing now actually is over 200 units because now institutions really become interested in your assets. Okay, so now when I say institutions, I'm talking about banks, lenders. And so one of the big things is how do you reduce your liability? And so, th so this all has to do with the land play because the big picture of this is finding a piece of land that is attractive not only to myself long term but to the banks because if let's say you're doing an LTV of 80 an 80 percent or 70 percent LTV a loan to value and so if you're going in you're doing an 80 70 percent the bank actually has more interest in that property than you do yourself okay so they don't really care about you they want to vet you out to make sure you have the experience you have the knowledge wisdom and ability to finish it because at the end of the day if they're going to lend you money all they want is a completed project and an asset because they own 80 percent of that project you only retain 20 percent of the equity because of the ltv that the bank holds they have more liability than you do yeah. so they'll do what's called a non-recourse loan on it and, and now what's cool is with the right lenders and right the right affiliates that we use we can even do construction loans with no recourse once you get the experience. Your first one, you'll probably have to do a full recourse loan. You may have to put your... What does that mean, recourse, non-recourse? Recourse is when you have, if you default on it, you're personally liable for it. it. They take the asset back, and if you still owe debt after they take the asset from you, you have to recover that debt. So you, so if you have a home or, or you it's have... It's like a personal guarantee. It's a personal guarantee. Okay, so let's let's go to like, okay, I'm, I'm meeting all these brokers. I fly, first off, like, Sunbelt states, I'm guessing Arizona, Texas, Florida, where else? Bro, California, doesn't matter. Affordable housing right now is needed everywhere. So it doesn't matter if you're in the Midwest. You can be anywhere in Texas. Texas, you can be in, in Austin, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio. You can be in Oklahoma City. You can be in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. You can be in Louisiana, anywhere in Louisiana, Florida, any place. There's just Doesn't not matter. enough housing. Okay. So we're going to meet with all the commercial brokers. We're going to tell them this is what we're looking for. So like how many acres, what are we telling them that we're looking for? Okay. So we want 100 units to 200 units. What do I tell them? So I want something that's zone ready. Okay, so if you want 100 units, you're going you're gonna to need to know that you need some place in the neighborhood of about three to five acres, give or take, depending on how dense that city will let you build. So you let them go to work for you. Now, one of the biggest mistakes most people make is they try to be the source for all their information and you don't wanna be that. So when you sit down with the brokers, you just tell them, I wanna build 100 units, I want something, a piece of land that fits my business model. And then they'll bring you everything under the sun. And then you can even tell them that if you, they find distressed assets that can be either leveled, 
Like one of the projects that we did, we actually um, had, we leveled a, a, this commercial building, but we did another one where we actually leveled a, a retail center to be able to build a multifamily. We didn't keep any of it. We just wanted the land, but it underwrote, right? The land only cost us $30 a square foot, which you can't even build for that. We were able to level it and land, the, the asset actually depreciated the land for us. So you don't even know sometimes what you're looking for other than the fact that they know your business model that you want to build 100 units of multifamily. Then when they bring you stuff, you start underwriting it and looking to see if the land even works. And so it starts off with a little bit of homework. Now, once they bring you the land, my first question to the broker is always, okay, so we have this piece of land. If I can theoretically build here and the city allows me to do so, is there a need for the multifamily in this area? And if there's a need, so they'll, all the CBRE guys, the Marcus and Milchap guys, all of the Colas um, brokers, all of the big institutional brokers, all the big guys, they have all the data. So what they'll do is they'll come in and you get all the data from them. You want to get the demographics, how many bedrooms you're going to need in each unit, one bedroom, two unit, what's the mix of units you need. And then they're going to come back and tell you exactly what the mix is that's needed in that area, the demographics you're dealing with, if there's, if there's a need to, um, in that area and can, and it, can it be filled. And then they're going to tell you what your rent rates are. And they're going to put together about a 30 page performer to get you, uh, together for you, giving you all the data and statistics on that area. Now, typically once I get that, even if, if, if broker, if broker A gave that to me, I'll take that information to broker B and C and I'll have them produce the exact same information on, on all for, for the, at that property from all three of those brokers. That way I want to see if there's consistency. What I'm looking for is consistency. So at each one you meet with, you're saying I want zone ready, I don't know, however many acres for 100, 100 plus units or however many units you intend to build, you let them go to work, they find you a bunch of options, then the next question is, if I was able to do this, the city allowed it, is this needed? Is it needed? Is it needed? And if they build this package and it shows you all the comps and all that stuff where it's like, yes, it's needed. All right. So now I'm feeling good. And I do that with two or three different brokers to get the consistency. Yep. And the, right, the banks are going to need that information as well. Okay. So that's it. So all this is important, not only for you, but it's also going to be important for the banks. Because remember the banks retained 80% of the, uh, the, the, the value of that property. Now, I don't only just stop at the brokers. I also go to wholesalers. I also go in and I, I promote it on social media. So I found a couple deals where people just reach out to us on Instagram or other social media sites. So once you do this and you make a decision that you're gonna move on it, just post it everywhere. Say, hey guys, I'm looking for multi-family um, pad sites all over the United States. Because you don't know States. if there's a broker or somebody, uh, maybe even an owner that is like, hey, I've been neglecting my thing. I'm getting older. I just want to get rid of I it. I want out on it. Yeah. So it's just planting seeds. And then something, once something comes in, you'll get a, about probably 90% of what you get is going to be a no. But the other 10% is what you're looking for. And that's when okay. you start focusing on your deals. All right. So let's say all that passes the sniff test. We now have a couple options for some land. Okay. It's needed. We got our little packages. We feel good. What do I do next? Okay, you put in a letter of intent. If it passes the sniff test, you put in a letter of intent. Letters of intent are non-binding. Okay, so to put in a letter of intent. Who's filling that out for you? You're, you? Do you have a commercial broker or are you writing that up yourself? No, commercial broker. I always- Okay, so you're gonna pick one of the commercial brokers you met with and you're gonna say, all right, you're my dude or chick. Yup. Let's write a letter of intent. Let's go. And so even if I, a wholesaler brought me the deal or, or just some random person from like a social media platform, then I'll go to the one I like the best, the one that I have yeah. the best relationship with that has, gives me the right information and is the most um, assertive. Now, are you negotiating with them, trying to get them to take down commissions or anything? Or are you just like, look, not on the I'm purchase. Okay. You want to pay them. Let these guys make money. There's enough, there's enough meat in this game. One thing that I've learned the most is that once I start negotiating down on stuff with people, the service that I get is just, it becomes subpar, right? Okay. So, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to um, win the battle and lose the war, you know, sort of say. You want to just go in, get them paid because there's enough meat on the bone that if it underwrites and it pencils, if it, if it pencils so tight that you need to negotiate with them, it's the wrong deal, okay? There's enough meat on these bones. We're talking multi-million dollar properties here. Okay, you're okay. multi-million dollar prop. All right, so uh, okay. what, what, what should I be paying for this? Let's say, they, let's say they show up and there's five acres available, or four acres, whatever it is, and it's zoned the right way, and it's just land right now, and I'm like, cool. What should I be paying for this land 
in so general. if it's not zone ready you want to pay less obviously because there's work involved in the entitlement process of getting it to that zoning now if it's already zone ready i'm willing to pay a little bit more so two years ago and the reason i talk about two years ago is because pre-pandemic numbers we were paying between 10 and twelve thousand dollars per door Okay, now we've been, we were paying as high as $25,000 per door for land um, post pandemic and during the pandemic because of how hyper. Um, so if I'm building 100 units, you just take, say it's 15,000 or 20,000 per door, you just take 15,000 times. However many doors you can entitle. And boom, that's now essentially what I should be paying. But, there, but there's a few things in here. So typically before I get there, we, we sit down, we put an offer together, we pencil it like that. Like we'll say, okay, we can um, potentially do a hundred doors here. And at this price, it makes sense. So let's put a letter of intent in so we take, so we can tie up the property. We can so even if it's listed for 500 grand more or 200 grand more or whatever, you're gonna come in with your letter of intent based on your price per door that you think that you should be paying. Yep. Now, if the land, is the land ever worth, worth or for sale for less than your calculation? Sometimes the one we just did in West Camelback was, okay. you know, that, one was that one's worth about 3.9 million. We paid 2.6 for it. All right. So right away, you're not really negotiating too hard. No, we gave, like we gave them hundred thousand dollars over list price. Yeah. You know, we had two other people that, that put in offers against us. We already knew what we were doing. And so we were able to move really fast because we had a team in that area. So we were, our, we were able to do more due diligence in a quicker amount of time than if we would have going in blindly into a city we had never been in before. Got so it. that's how we won that deal. All right, so keep, keep going. So. So, we go, so, we get the, so we get the land. Now, when we, once we get the letter of intents put in and we get the land, that's not, your, that's not your end point to negotiating. Now you have what's called a due diligence period. So once we get to a place where, and, and we're doing our due diligence all through this process. The biggest mistake most people make is they stop that process right until they actually retain the land. We don't, we go to work on the land expecting that that land is gonna work out for us. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But we go to work on it like if it's gonna work on it for us indefinitely. So right away we'll retain an architect and we'll, put it, have it, we'll pay an architect so there's a little bit of an investment up front. You have to pay a little bit of money to make some money. And so we'll go in and we'll, we'll retain an architect and say, hey, if we give you $5,000, can you put together a pre-development plan that we can take to the city to see if this is a product that they're, ever in, they're even interested in. And even before we get to the architect, we'll go down and we'll sit with the city. And what most people, the biggest mistake most people make is they go in and they propose something to the city without talking to them. The number one question that I ask the city, and this is huge, is I just go in and I, I sit with the city. I sit down with the, the, the planning department and the building and zoning department. The planning department is the most important one because they're the ones that ultimately are going to say yay or nay on the project. And so when I sit down with the planning department, I say, what are you guys doing as a city currently that we can support? in lieu of building what we want to build. Like how, if, we, if we propose something, what is it that you guys want to see? And I find out what the city wants first before I tell them what I want. And it's just like any, any negotiation, right? Most people think it's a one-way street and only what, what they want is all that matters. Everything with the city, it's all about what the city wants. And then we go in and we flip it back and we, we make what we have attractive to the city based on what their, what their goals are. Mm, so I asked the city, what are your goals? What do you guys want? What are you guys looking for? What's your five-year projections, 10-year projections? And how can we fit into that? How can we become a part of that? So then right away, we start getting city support based on us supporting what their growth and their, and their direction is. And that's how we get approvals on this stuff. Okay, now we go back to the architect and we tell them, look, these are the, these are the, these are the points we need to hit with the city. And so if we hit these points, when we're thinking about everything that we're doing, we need dog parts, we need progressive, we need walk trails, we need, we need to make sure that we're fulfilling the urban fill that the city wants, for sake of example. And then the architect goes to work and they start fulfilling those punch list items. Okay. And then we review them with the architect, we make sure we hit them, and then we go back to the city and then we present our, ta our case to the city. Okay? Then the city comes in, they, either, they, they, they don't yay or nay us, but they give us recommendations. Then we go back to the drawing boards and we, we go back and, and do an, an, a revision to it before we even go in and we start talking to all the municipalities. All, all of the, uh, not the municipalities, before we go talk to all the different departments like the fire department and all the other departments that have to walk, look at our plans, okay? Okay. So once we do that, we're still in our due diligence period, okay? We still have an exercise. This is all in the first 60 days. Okay, so if you could tie up the land, you get 60 days worth of due diligence. Now we go in with a little bit of deposit. We show our commitment. We put a purchase agreement together. We're feeling comfortable that this is going to get approved. So if they sign a letter of intent with you, can they sign a letter of since non-binding? Can they sell the property from out from underneath you? Yeah, they sure can. That's why you go from a letter of intent, you do some due diligence. But if they know you, you're serious because not everybody, not every 
person out there is looking for these type of, uh, of assets. And you'd be surprised how many people that even if they are, don't know what they're doing. Okay, so one of the biggest things is understanding a little bit about what I'm talking about here about how to deal with the city. Um, we're picking up a project right now in Plano, Texas, where they had proposed a Section 8 housing apartment complex in an area where there was $1.4 million homes and above right in that vicinity. Nobody wants Section 8 housing in a subdivision that there's over mo over million dollar homes in it, right? But they never talked to the city. So because of that, the city shut them down, but we went and talked to the city and the city goes, we would love to have the apartment here. We just need something that fits this area. And so right now we're in the process of talking to the city to try to gain their approval of what they want. Same thing Got I told it. you. So now we'll just go in and we'll build it vertical to what the city wants. Got it. Okay, so now you're at a point where your architect has done some revisions. It matches what the city wants. Now we're going back. Now we're going to do a full-fledged purchase and sale contract. So we're negotiating. At the same time that we're doing all of this stuff, those working pieces, just like I said earlier, you don't stop working until you get to the end negotiation. We're still working back and forth on the, on the letter of intent and the purchase agreement simultaneously. While we're doing this with- But what if they said in the letter of intent, yeah, we'll take your number. But now you might retrade. Is that what you're saying? You might you might chop it down a so little these bit based aren't, on what you discovered. These aren't like residential deals where you put a purchase agreement together in two or three days. This is what I love about the commercial industry. Everybody has attorneys. Everybody takes a little bit of time because there's different people that are looking at, at paperwork. So you put a letter of intent. You go back and forth two or three times. That burns up two weeks right there alone. Then you get to a letter of intent where everybody's happy. So then we say, okay, who's drafting it? You, do you want us to draft it? Do you want to draft it? Who's drafting the, the purchase agreement? So then that takes another week just to draft it. And then they send us a purchase agreement. We say, okay, great, we'll go with our, we'll get it to our attorney. So then we, we send it to our attorney. That takes a week for them to review. Then we send it back to their attorney another week to review. So we've already, now we're like five weeks into this deal and we're doing work through that entire five weeks. We haven't even still got into our due diligence period yet because we don't even have a signed purchase agreement yet. So we just got free five weeks of due diligence period before we even have any type of financial commitment, but everybody's invested because we're investing in attorneys, paperwork, negotiations, everything. So we have five weeks worth of work done. Now we finally, five weeks into it, we get a purchase agreement on this deal. Okay, we already know what we're doing. We've talked to the city. We have a, we have a preliminary plan. We always make our architects do a 14 day um, clause where they have to have us something within 14 days to present to the city. That's a key component. Okay, so 14 day clause for our architect. And then once we get that commitment, then we give them the deposit and we start migrating forward on things. And then by the time we get the purchase agreement, now we have another 60 days to be able to close on the land. We're not even closed, that's just our due diligence period. Maybe we do a 90 day close and a 60 days worth of due diligence. We just have five weeks of free due diligence, plus we have another 60 days. Now we go in and we start exercising the process of entitlements. And at this point in time, if we know we have the deal and we're committed to the deal, now we're going to pay the architect to do full, full drawings, okay, full technical drawings, mm -hmm. which that becomes, starts becoming a little bit more of a commitment because that's going to cost about 70 grand. Seven zero? Seven zero. Okay. Okay. This is big boy stuff, right? This is big boy stuff. Yep. This isn't so, little boy stuff. This is all, yep. this now, is big boy commitment well, stuff. Are they crediting your first five? Or are they like, just give me 70 more and we'll, we'll get these No, back. they're crediting you. I mean, okay, the, whole, right. the whole investment's between, it was going to cost you somewhere between 50 and 70. And 70 through the whole process, but you're not yeah. paying it all up front. Got it. Okay, so there's, there's parts that you're breaking up. The whole entitlement's going to cost you 70 grand, but that's over like a six-month period. So okay. you give them a, a $5,000 deposit, then maybe another $20,000, and then that gets you moving on your full vertical architecture and your three-dimensional design. So what happens after the architect or while the architect is doing their thing? Because that's going to take some time. So the second we have the property tied up, we go in for geotechnical engineering. We have soil tests done on the land. We make sure that the land is good, the dirt is clean, there's nothing that has to be um, rectified on the land because that's a big deal. We make sure that there's no, we also get the survey companies immediately. Why don't we tie up the land in that five weeks of free period that we're talking about, we get the survey companies out there getting what's called an Alta survey, and then we get them out to, there to do a topographic survey at the exact same time. That's about a $2,000 commitment. So you get, you get those two done. So now we have the lay of the land, we have the surveys done, we have the, 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 the topography of the land, and we take all of that information and we do our dirt and our soil tests on the land, make sure it's clean, and then we take package all that information and we send it to our civil engineer. And so the civil engineer is probably one of your most important engineers because they're going to do all your underground work. They're going to tell you about utilities, fire sprinklers, electrical. They're going to tell you about all your underground work, where it needs to go, what's going to be needed, where it's at in the road, and what you're going to need to, uh, in order to develop the project. Okay? So we take it to the civil engineers. Um, we're also talking to Department of Transportation because you just took a piece of land, 
okay, that's been vacant for ever, right, forever, and there's density here, and there's just curves here. Now you're going to create an inlet here, you're going to create an outlet here that's going out, and then you're going to do a little outlet here, okay? There's a little residential road. This is maybe a big highway, Yeah. okay? So there's going to be some off-site expenses that are going to have to be done. So you want to talk to the Department of Transportation. They say, do I need to do a slow down lane? You know, is there any road improvements I need to do? Or if they've sidewalks, already done them, all the sidewalks, curb, gutters, the edging exactly. of your complex. That are unforeseen expenses, right? You want to know, like, do I have to spend a million dollars improving the roads? Is that going to be a million dollar improvement that I'm not thinking about? Yeah. And this is all stuff that most people don't ever think about. That's where experience comes in. That's why the banks want somebody that has that type of experience. So then I sit back, okay, we've got to be thinking about this stuff. So right away, I start calling and making these phone calls, and I send them my preliminary drawings. Say, hey, this is what we're proposing. We just want to know, like, what's the impact, you know? So then you have to get a, a traffic engineer, and you pay a traffic engineer like 10000 bucks to do the whole project, and they start doing the traffic engineering. They, they, want, they tell you how, and they usually already have this data. They just put it in a report form for you that you submit to the city, and they say there's going to be this X amount of impact. We're going to need a turning lane here. That turning lane is going to cost you half a million dollars, okay, to, to put in, theoretically. So we start looking at all that stuff, okay? Now this is all happening during our due diligence period because what we're doing is we're, we're striking out X's. We're going, okay, we got, we got, we're out of flood zones, we got civil engineering, the project is, is viable, the traffic, um, the traffic impact isn't gonna affect us too much, the, the cost is absorbable throughout the entire project, right? We're not paying for that, that's gonna come out of the loan, the institutional money. We just wanna know what our, what our costs are. All we're doing is we're mitigating risk. 100% of everything we're doing in the due diligence period is mitigating risk. So the more experience you have, it's, it's, it's real important because the more you know that you're gonna need, the more questions you can ask and the more homework you can do to make sure that you have all your costs set in place beforehand. That way you don't get through the entire project and you sit back and go, oh, shit, I have a million dollar improvement I need to do the roadway that you didn't budget for. That would for. be awful. Yeah, it is. And even for the banks, because the banks, all the banks want is a completed project. So here's what's cool, okay? So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of push fast forward real quick here because I can spend, I can literally spend hours on each one of these individual things and you won't learn the whole process. So I wanna take you guys to the next process. So let's say, all this works out, the zoning works out, your due diligence works out, the plans are being done, we're getting the engineers on board, electrical engineers, civil engineers, structural engineers, fire sprinkler engineers, the whole nine works, okay? Now all these guys have sets of plans, they're all going to work. In that process, we're working through zoning, we're getting uh, permit approvals, city approvals, um, transportation approvals, all that stuff is simultaneously going. Nine months worth of this stuff that you're going through, back and forth between engineers. All of that is called entitlements. Yeah, it's fully, so there's different levels of entitlement. Cause some people say, you'll go to a broker and they'll be like, well, the land's already entitled. It's already zone ready. Okay, I'm saying, so it's partially entitled. And they go, no, no, it's fully entitled. Go, well, you got prints. You got prints, you got designs, architecture, everything, our engineering. Well, no, we don't have that, but it, it's fully entitled. Yeah. So when they mean the land is fully entitled, that means it's zone ready for whatever you're gonna I do. I got it. All right, so, so now yeah. that whole nine month period, you're a couple hundred thousand. We're going in for pocket. full entitlements. What I call full entitlements is when it's fully entitled, zone ready, permit ready. You go, to, you go in, you submit to the city, you have a full set of prints, and they're gonna give you back permits. That's fully entitled. Okay. Okay? So we're fully entitled. Now, that's the most important part of everything because three months before you're fully entitled, guess who we're talking to? Banks. The banks. Yeah. Okay. So because our money is in the prints, a hundred percent of our money is in the entitlements. It's in the prints. Okay. And I go like that. It's, it's a little big fat roll of prints that you're going to have when you're done. They're all electronic now, by the way, but we go in, we have a full set of entitlements. We take those, we drop them off at the bank. We send them electronically to them. And then they send out an appraiser to walk the property. And then they open up the prints. The, the appraisers will call you to ask you questions. They'll call your architects to ask them questions. And they're gonna, they wanna find out a little bit more about it. So that same performa that the multifamily brokers put together, we'll take all three of them again. We'll also send those to the brokers as well. And we'll have them updated at that time because rents may change in that nine months. A year later, it might be slightly different. It might be better in our, in our benefit. So we go back in. If they're not in our benefit, we just give them the nine month old ones. If, they're not, if they are in our benefit, we update them to the new ones to sure. give them the newest, latest and greatest. So we're trying to get the appraisal to give us a good appraisal because we need money. That's right. And if we get the money, then we're off to the races. Now up to this point, have you raised any money? Or is this just like, hey, I'm gonna put out the couple hundred grand to get the ball rolling, big boy stuff. Great, great question. Great question. Where's that money? So that depends, okay? So what I try to do 
is I still try to have control of the land and not own it. If I can, if in a perfect world, Cody, perfect world, I could, let's say, I can, if I can tie this land up for a year without owning it, but I control it through my purchase agreement and the terms, then I'm gonna do it. Try and get the owner to just, hey, just roll still. with me. I'm gonna put up the money to go through all this entitlements and stuff. And I'll usually but go- But don't make me close on the land. Yeah, and I'll typically go non-refundable. It's called going hard on your money. So I'll come in and say, okay, I'm gonna give you $50,000 just to tie it up right now, okay? After my due diligence period, I'm gonna give you another $50,000, but 50 of that's gonna go hard, meaning non-refundable. Yep. And it's just showing a, le a good faith level of commitment, right? And for me, it's worth it. Even if I had to take 100,000 of it and I knew the project was gonna go, I put $100,000 in hard and it just buys me time. I got free time, no liability. Because my liability starts the day I take ownership of that land until the day I finish construction on that land. So I, only, I, 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 I wanna kind of button up this video okay. just cause it's getting a little long. I know this is good stuff guys, but like we've now like gone through a large section of this and I will always have Jerome back to finish like the construction part and the leasing part but just tie a bow on it all. Okay. So we're at the bank, they get an appraisal. What, are, what kind of loan, like is this a, a, give me like a basic loan structure. So, that let, we're so let's just talk, they're gonna do what's called a, a 70 to 80% loan to cost. That's your, that's your loan to, uh, the cost to build. That's the cost to build, okay? Now, when we go in, we do retail cost to build. So if I'm the builder, or I'm hiring a builder, and I'm working with them, and we're, we're trying to save money on it, we go in and we do a retail cost to build. Like if you're hiring- So you're gonna build a, literally a line item cost breakdown. It's gonna cost us $24 million to build this asset. And then when you do that- But term, it really only cost you 18. 18 million, yep. Got it. And then here's what's cool, is that if you, once you get experience, and they do an 80% LTV, or loan to cost on it, what happens is the bank is gonna tell you, okay, do you have contingency costs? And they're gonna, they're gonna mandatorily make you add a minimum of 10, but most of the time 15% in contingencies. So 15% more, you're really only in 5% on your equity on a retail cost. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And so, so now- Because they're, they're giving you extra money because they don't want you to have to come back later and be like, uh, sorry, we didn't the see banks, this and that. Yeah, no. the banks just want it finished. Yeah. They don't care. They want to know that you have the experience and they want it finished because an unfinished um, asset is worthless. And how I get this loan is I got to partner with a guy like you who already has relationships and you're like my sponsor. Because if I just roll up to the bank and I've never done this before and I don't have the experience, they're going to be like, yeah, get out of here. Yeah, they tell you, or down. put 50% down and we might talk to you. Yeah. All right. So, so yeah, you're going to have to come in with more or you have to have a general contractor that has the experience to do it, which they're going to take a lot of your profits in doing it. All right. Screw that. I want to partner. All right. So um, now we're sitting with the bank. Everything's lining up. Uh, in this scenario is, do we own this land or? Now, now we take, so we'd either take ownership so we either take ownership of this land when we close on the construction loan or we'll, we'll exit out our investors. So like, for example, one of the deals that we're doing on West Camelback, the way we were able to get that is we had to do a 30 day close with them. We burnt a 30 days, then we did a 30 day so close. So you had to close. So, so we had to close. You brought in an investor. So the land was 2.6 million. Okay. So the land, but the pro whole project's a $78 million project. Okay. Okay. 2.6 million. We come in, we raised, we raise that plus another 900K. Okay, and what do you pay investors to raise 2.6 million? We'll pay them anywhere between 10% and 15%, depending on how much. Just a flat percentage. Per percentage. Okay, so that's great. So you're raising debt. Yep, so we'll raise debt. And so how long are debt. you telling them you're gonna raise debt for? Just so the usually, entitlement period? We'll, we'll tell, we'll tell them two to it. three years. Okay, so for the whole entire construction period. So we'll tell them that only because we don't know what we're gonna get yet, right? Circumstances like the ones we're in now, yeah. banking, banking rules change. Got so it. we wanna have, want have the affordability of time. Got it, and what's the extra 900K for, just money? 900K is, yeah, it's to service our debt. It's to pay these guys back. Okay, so you overraise and then use the money to pay, to pay back, back. To, to float the, th the three years. Because the overall vision is you, you get it entitled, you get a contractor, you build the thing out, then at the end of the project, if it cost you, you said this project's gonna cost how much? 76 this, million? This is gonna be a gross of about a $78 million To cost, project. or is that the no. retail value? The whole, project, the whole project's gonna cost us about 40 mil. Okay, so you're gonna be all in at 40 million. It's gonna, at some point, be worth 78 at the end when you refinance it out of the construction loan. 
at which point you're going to pay off that 2.6, the 900, all that stuff. So here's the real goal. That's worst case scenario. Okay. Best case scenario is we come back in. Now we go in one year later, we have all our entitlements, nine months, 12 months later, we have all our entitlements. We go into the bank, we get this loan here. That, that loan also includes this land. Okay. This land, once it's fully entitled, is now worth, we just got appraised at 3.9 million. So we'll use that so number. So you already gained 1.3 million in equity just, just by entitling the, the land. In, just by entitling so the land. So now you can almost cash these people out. Or so we do cash them out. So okay. we, we go in, we pay these people off, okay? We pay all these people off, we get them back 100% of all their money. And then we go into the, and then we just have institutional money. Sometimes we'll raise a little bit of money here. Sometimes we don't even have any investors in. We own 100% of the asset. Do you guys understand what's happening here? Like guys like Grant go out and they, and Vina and a bunch of people, they do syndications where they're literally selling off part of their equity to investors. Jerome is raising debt, using his construction knowledge to add value to the land bringing in all the pieces, puppeteering everything, then paying off the debt, who's the only person left in the deal? Jerome. So Jerome is gonna own an $80 million property that cash flows like crazy yeah. by himself. Yeah. This is why I love this business model. So you take $80 million, let's say that thing's just do, rolling at a 5% cap rate, okay? That means all expenses are paid. This is your net out after all expenses, management fees, maintenance fees, everything. You take an, an, a $78 million property, okay? So 78 times 0 0.05, you're making $2.4 million a year in cash flow. And you got the forced depreciation or the, excel, uh, the cost segregated yeah. depreciation. So think, he's not paying taxes. So Guys, he's not paying taxes. He owns an asset, you're making $2 million. Did you say a year? So I can depreciate Did everything you say a year? but the land. A year, $2.4 million hate, a year. I hate this guy. <laughs> I wanna be this guy. You want to be this guy? If you, listen, look, this video is getting long. I wanted you to keep going because we were starting to get in the yeah, meat and yeah, potatoes and stuff. Look, we haven't even got to the construction side of things yet, the leasing side of things, but I got to shut this video off because I got to leave you guys wanting more. So here's the reality of this thing. We got to have you back. Yeah, bro. Okay. We got to have you back, man. Like you just, you're showing us literally the path to financial freedom and you can do this. You just need a guy like him in your corner. And you can get to him through me, by the way. You gotta come through me. Don't just go directly to him <laughs> at Jerome Maldonado. What is it? The yeah, JeromeMaldonado.com. Oh yeah, screw that. Don't go to JeromeMaldonado.com. Come, come through me and I'll connect you with him. All right, listen guys, if you got something from this video, smash the like button, drop a comment down below and beg for Jerome to come back and finish training us on how to, now that we got the land entitled, we're now at the bank, we gotta figure out how to actually you know, like build this damn thing. Like, where do we get the contractor? How do we, you know, babysit the car? Like, if we don't know what the heck we're doing, how do you know how to build a hundred units and not screw it up? Do you overbuild? Do you put, do you put pools in? Do you put clubhouses in? Do you put green belts and all this other stuff in? How do you do it? We need that video. And then we need the video on how to lease it up. And one last thing, there's five ways that you generate capital from these five different ways. And we've only broken down one. We talked about a second one but I haven't even shown you guys the meaty, meaty goodness of all this. Mmm, meaty. Smash the like button. Till next time, we're out of here. Take care, comb your hair. We'll see you next time, peace.